I'm Pastor Tom, and welcome to the Sunday Sermon. is on the main line just tell him what you want oh jesus is on the main line just tell him what you want jesus is on the main line just tell him what you want or just call him up and tell him what you want just call him up and tell him won't you tell him what you want you might recall that we were i was knocking my way through uh, the book of genesis for a while and we got in quite a ways we gotten through the story of abraham and then the death of abraham marked a kind of good place to stop and we switched to, uh, I think that was when we switched over to Job, and then we did the gospel, we've been in the gospel of Luke, and then in Acts, and we came to a good stopping point in the book of Acts as well. So I'll come back to the book of Acts next, probably next summer, and I'm going to return now to the book of Genesis and read to you from Genesis chapter um, 25. This is the, the family of Isaac, Abraham's son. So Isaac's father was Abraham, and when he was 40 years old, he married Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Padam Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian. He took her to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of Rebekah because she had not had a child. And the Lord answered, and Rebekah conceived, but it was a difficult pregnancy. And she prayed, she said, why, what is happening here? And the Lord answered her and said, two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. Now, when the days of her pregnancy were complete, she gave birth to twins. The first one came forth. He was red, covered in red hair, hairy like a garment. And so they named him Red, Esau. And afterwards, his brother came. And his brother had grabbed on to Esau's heels. So they decided to call him Grabber, Jacob. Now Isaac was 60 years old at the time of the birth of the two boys. And the boys were growing up, and Esau was a skillful hunter, He's a real man of the field, an outdoorsman. Jacob, on the other hand, was a bit of a homebody. He spent his time among the tents. And so it happened that Isaac, well, he preferred Esau because he liked hunting and he liked wild game. Rebecca, on the other hand, she preferred Jacob. Now, one day, Jacob was cooking some stew and Esau came in from the field, he was very hungry, and saw that Jacob was doing this. So he said, give me, give me a serving of that red stuff there, said, red stew. Give me some of that red stew, for I am famished. That's also why his other nickname is Edom, which also means red. They're, they're playing on the name red here. Um, and Jacob said, first you sell me your birthright. And Esau said, I'm about to die. What use is a birthright to me? And Jacob said, well, then swear it. And so Esau swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of stew. Jacob gave Esau bread and stew. And Esau ate and drank and then went on his way. And in this way, Esau despised his own birthright. Judging by the tenor of the story, I suspect they're teenagers at this time. That sounds like a teenage conversation to me. Uh, and you got, I, 
I really want you to do this. Just be so careful about not picturing saints when you read the stories of the saints of the Bible. They're, um, the, the saintliness doesn't come from them. It comes from the, the way in which God chooses to use them and work in them. They are really ordinary people with highly dysfunctional families. This is a really dysfunctional family. Now, it's not uncommon that you can have a family where you've got two parents and you have multiple kids and some of the kids kind of, you know, relate more with dad and others relate more with mom. But this is one of those clearly, you know, favorites, clear favorites. And you can also get this distinction between the two types of men these are, or young men these are, teenagers these are, Esau, the outdoorsman, the, you know, he's the, he's the kind where that's my son. Yeah, that guy. And uh, Jacob's the one who's like, hey, mom, teach me to cook. <laughs> right? He's that guy. And so they're very different, these two. And the conflict in the families that are starting are going to be long. They are. But I think about this story from a different perspective, too, because I, you know, when, there's a trick you can use when you're reading the Bible, which is you sort of ask yourself, who am I in this story? You go look for someone in the story, and you kind of, I'm like this person in the story. Sometimes you'll find more than one. But it's helpful to do that because it's a way of, of relating to the story, of inserting ourselves into a story, and then to also, it gives us some sense of what the story can mean for us not just what it meant for someone else or what it meant when it was originally written, but also what it might mean for us. And so I do that all the time. And I start looking at this stuff, and I, I look at the story, and I think, wow. I mean, think about this. We live in a world that is constantly trying to get us to sell our birthright, to sell our future. Now, if you don't believe me, just watch TV long enough, and you'll see a commercial uh, for a company, I won't name them, but they advertise that they will pay you a cash settlement for your, for your annuitized settlement. So an annuity is a fixed amount of money that you get like every month or every year, and it goes on as long as you're alive. So a lot of times when people are in car accidents or something like that, they'll have a settlement that involves a guaranteed payment to them of a certain amount of money. Usually there's a cost of living thing built into that, but every month or every year they'll get a certain amount of money and it will come automatically until they die, and that, that's how the settlement is done. Rather than like, here's $2 million for your, for your, because of the accident, rather it's, you can't work anymore, so we're going to pay you money through your entire lifetime. It's a very common practice. And so there's this company that looks at that and they say, well, why should that person be getting that money when we could have it? Right? This is, this is how, I, you, you know, think about the Black Hills. You know, the Black Hills are sacred land to Native Americans. So how come it's not tribally controlled? Right? Well, this is how I like to put it. The white guys looked and they said, well, we can't help it if God put our gold in their holy mountains. Right? I mean, that's the attitude that, that people have. Well, they've got money. I should have that money, not them. So this company says, hey, it's your money. I love how they do that. <laughs> Why should you have to wait? Give us a call and we will pay you cash in exchange for your annuity. In other words, they're going to pay a chunk of money and then they're going to take that annuity and they're going to collect a whole lot more. They're going to give you a piece of it now so that you don't have it your whole life. So in other words, a person is selling their future because they, hey, you need money now. It's your money, but they're selling their future out. Because the whole point of that kind of a setup is that in 50 years, when they're you know, nearing retirement age or when they are retired, they've got this guaranteed money coming in. That in, in 10 years, they've got guaranteed money. But if you hand them a bunch of money now, and they, then what happens in 10 years? And I've watched people do this. I mean, I knew a, a, a couple, they had, they had talked to me about, um, <clears throat> sometimes when I deal with people uh, in need, I, I get to know them over time and I get to see how they kind of operate. So I know what's best in terms of how to help them in the future, but not, not always at first. So at one point, they were talking to me and the, the, the husband was like, yeah, we're going to need, we need a place to stay. I said, well, I'll tell you what, um, I've got, you know, I, I will... You find a place to stay, and I'll help you with the down payment. I get 125 bucks for the down payment. So when you find a place, I'll help you with that down payment. Okay, that'll be great. And then after a while, I get a call from, from his wife. She says, well, we need some money. 
and you said you had 125 bucks that you could help us with. You say, yeah, when you get a place, I will help you with your down payment. Well, we don't need that. We need, but we need the money now. I said, for what? <laughs> I don't remember, car, something, whatever it was. I said, okay, well, tell me who's doing the work and I'll give them that money. But you're sure you're not gonna need it later? You don't need, you need it now for this, not later for that? That's right. Well, guess what happened when it came time for that? They called me up again. You were gonna help. Uh, you already used up that money. You, in other words, you despised that future that you had. I'd given you, I'd given you a future. I, I said, I will do this. And then you just, I don't wanna wait for that. This is the world we live in. The whole world operates this way. So what is your birthright? Your birthright, your birthright is to be, um, to, to be loved which means to be loved by others and to be loved by yourself and to be loved by God. But you can't make a lot of money when people are content and happy because they are well-loved. But you can make a lot of money if they're uncomfortable. So now what you have to do is you have to tell them they're not beloved, they're not loved, they're not, you know what, if you wore this special perfume, then he would love you. If you had these really cool blue jeans and you drove this really cool red car, then she would be attracted to you. That's what the message starts to be. And so instead of like, hey, I've got a birthright, it's like, no, wait, I have to buy this thing. I have to sell out my future in order to have this thing, which I actually already have, which I'm entitled to. This doesn't make any sense, but this is actually what the world does. Because the world looks at it and says, why should you have that when I want it? The world wants it, so it goes to take it. The world wants to grab it from us, and it's going to manipulate. It's always going to try to get us on a deal that is not a deal at all. That's what the world wants to do. It always wants to figure out a way to get something from you of greater value than what the world gives to you in exchange. And so we live in that place. We become like Esau, constantly being invited to sell out our birthright. And that's why, you know, we struggle with things like going to church on Sunday, because we have the birthright to be children of God and to live as children of God, but the world says, well, you don't have time for that. That's, you, we've got too many other really important things to do. In fact, we have made sure that Target, Walmart, and all the other stores are open all day Sunday, because when else are you going to go shopping? and part with your hard-earned cash, right? And this is the world. This is the world. And so it becomes difficult for us to, to hold to the things that are of true value today, the things that are our, our birthright today, to hold on to them. It is hard for us not to be Esau and to go, at this moment, I'm really hungry, and yeah, I don't care about tomorrow. Just give me something to eat. But we are not called to that. We are called to an eternal viewpoint where God wants us to, to see things in the long term. That it's not just about what's going to happen today. It's what happens in our forever. That's where we are. That's the place we're supposed to be thinking, to have those kinds of eyes, that kind of vision. I don't mean not um, that we shouldn't also be in the moment, you know, in that sense of being present. But I mean that the present and the future are so connected to each other that the promise of the future is the happiness and birthright of the present. That's where we need to be. That's the struggle. Now, this is a biblical story. I do not want to be Jacob. I do not want to be the guy who's grabbing, who's trying to take more than I give, who's trying to cheat somebody out of what's important. And I do not want to be the Esau who is selling what is of great value for just some immediate moment of satisfaction or need met. I want to be a person who is neither of these two characters, but rather the character that God envisions for them each, for them both, but who they have not yet become. Can you find now the prayer of response? And please stand, we're going to pray that together. Gracious God, forgive me when I become so concerned with the things of this moment that I forget the things which are of lasting value. Forgive me when I neglect past and future and misprize what has been entrusted to me. Keep me ever mindful of the things which are truly and vitally important and teach me to give up the momentary for the permanent. Through Jesus Christ, I pray. 
Amen. We'd love to have you join us for Sunday worship at 8.30 at the Christ United Methodist Church or 10.15 at the Stanton United Methodist Church. Until next time, may the Lord God bless you and keep you. May the face of the Almighty be upon you. And may God grant you peace. When the Lord gets ready, you got to move. Oh, you got to move.